Hello, it's Scott Manley here. For the last year, the OSIRIS-REx mission has been carefully scrutinizing the asteroid Bennu, looking for a place that it can safely touch down. The OSIRIS-REx mission has one of its big mission priorities as collecting a significant sample from the surface of an asteroid. Now, it won't be the first spacecraft to get a sample back. That would have been Hayabusa. Hayabusa 2 has already uh, sampled this, but this should be a much larger amount of material. The sampling system involves touching down with a sort of device like this and then blowing gas through it to entrain particles, pull them up into a sample drum, and then carry it off. This requires debris or gravel on the surface that is sufficiently small that it can be entrained uh, by the gas. And this meant that the sample site had to be carefully selected. They had to be locations where they could see that there was gravel that was small enough. And they did actually come up with four locations, and these were given candidate names of Nightingale, Osprey, Sandpiper, and Kingfisher. Now, none of these sample sites actually conform to the original mission criteria, as well as being able to have material that could be sampled. The original mission required that there would be no boulders or any large you know, features within 25 metres. None of these sites is bigger than 10 metres. Beyond the sampleability and spacecraft safety requirements, the scientists also desired to find the most interesting sites. But while Bennu is you know, only 500 metres across and has a surface area of less than one square kilometre, that was still a lot of space for a small team to cover. So they actually worked with CosmoQuest to allow members of the public to look at images that were being taken by uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, classify the objects, classify the rocks, measure them, and uh, allow, you know assist the scientists in selecting these sites. So the sites are spread over the surface in you know, a few different locations, and just the last few weeks they've been teasing a final decision. The final decision was actually made during the uh, AGU meeting in San Francisco this week. And the final selection was Nightingale, which in part was chosen because it was so far north. 55 degrees made it the furthest north location. So you can see the 3D view here shows how this is just basically a fine-grained sand bit in the middle of lots of rocks. Uh, in fact, that big spiky rock at the top there, on the you know at the very top right now, they apparently colloquially refer to that as Mount Doom because they're very worried about what could happen if the spacecraft hits it. Now, the way the spacecraft is going to come down is it's going to be you know, vertical into this crater to take the sample, but when it takes the sample, it's entirely possible that it gets bumped one way or another and it rotates. And after it rotates, it is going to fire its engines and try to leave the asteroid. And if it has twisted too much, it's entirely possible it cr crashes into that mountain range. And when I say a mountain range, it is, you know, a couple of meters high. It's not a huge object by any means. So, yeah, the reason why the high latitude is important is because they're looking at the origins of the solar system and they're wanting to find the pristine solar nebular materials. They're also looking for things like carbonaceous materials, which contain a lot of organics. They're looking for hydrated materials with water. And because the sample site is further north, over time it gets less sunlight. And that's important because the sun can change the materials, it can bake out the features that they're really looking for. So that is the primary site. It is not the only site. You see, while they have to navigate down into this crater and try to take this sample, there are situations where they might not be able to take a sample or they might try to take the sample and it doesn't work. And either way, they could end up disturbing this site too much and they might not feel that it's worth going back. There might be new risks or reduced scientific rewards. So they've come up with a backup site and that site is Osprey. It's not on, it's not as far north, it's on the equator, but else, everything else being equal, they decided that there's a lot less hazard involved here, so it might be a better option. 
The sampling system can actually attempt multiple samples. It uses nitrogen gas to blow the material into its collection system, and it has backups if the first one doesn't work, or if it gets a sample which isn't sufficiently heavy. What it can do is lift up the sample canister and swing it around to figure out how much the inertia changes. And if there's not enough material, they can go back and get more. Yet the spacecraft is actually quite smart. In fact, it's going to have to be very smart. It's going to have to be smarter than they originally thought. You see, back when they were designing this mission, again, as I said, they expected a flat surface of gravel that they could sample. But now they have to really think hard about avoiding these features. So when they were designing it, they had LiDAR for navigation. But just in case the LiDAR broke, they put software on the spacecraft to perform natural feature tracking so that they can find these objects and use those for navigation and of hazard avoidance and everything. That wasn't expected to be needed for hazard avoidance, but it turns out they're going to need that capability to be able to correctly identify their location within the craters and get into the exact target they want to hit. So this was software they added for another like hardware failure, when in fact it's going to be essential to deal with the landscape being far more hostile than they expected. I mean, just to give you an idea of the sample sites they're hitting, the orange ring was the original error bar that they expect to be able to hit with the onboard software. The blue ring is what they're going to have to hit, and they're going to have to make some changes to their programs to do this. They will also have to understand where these features are and use those for the navigation to get them down and hit that target without hitting the boulders because the boulders they can't sample and the boulders might break something else. Because when this mission started planning, these were the best images that we had of Bennu. They were constructed by radar from Arecibo Observatory and they were maybe you know 30 to 40 meter resolution. They gave us a lot of information about the asteroid, but they couldn't possibly see the really tiny objects, the boulders on the surface that are causing trouble. They also couldn't see the debris getting thrown off into space, which was a very big surprise. In fact, the team that found them felt it was their duty to notify NASA that their spacecraft was potentially flying into space debris, so they picked up the phone and never got an answer because it was during the government shutdown, which is probably good because otherwise some you know, safety-minded individual might have moved the spacecraft too far away. Instead, of course, the scientists started to characterize these uh, fragments coming off and actually started plotting their orbits. Most of the fragments appear to come from small explosive events. And when I say explosive, it's more like rocks cracking and throwing fragments off into space. Most of the fragments fall back to the surface, but some can potentially reach escape velocity. This does mean that the space probe is moving through potentially debris nearby, but it is moving at the orbital velocity around Bennu, which is comparable to walking pace. Anyway, OSIRIS-REx is going to spend several more years studying asteroid Bennu before it returns towards Earth. Elsewhere, asteroid Ryugu, which looks suspiciously similar in size and shape and color, uh, that was being studied by Hayabusa 2, and Hayabusa 2 has finally said sayonara to the asteroid. It is heading home, it's lit its fire, well, I was going to say it lit its iron drive, it's powered up its ion drive and it is powering homewards with its small collection of samples. Now its sampler system wasn't nearly as capacious as that on board OSIRIS-REx, but it is, was able to take two samples from two different sites. This was the second sample they took later from the site that was created via a crater made by the small carry-on impactor, which I've described as a shaped charge anti-tank weapon designed for shooting asteroids. I've mentioned the SCI before. It's actually a small subspacecraft that gets deployed by the main spacecraft, and then the main spacecraft goes and hides while this thing takes a shot at the asteroid. And because everyone was really interested to see what it looked like when you shot an asteroid, they actually had a third deployable spacecraft, a deployable camera, that would sit and just take pictures of the event. And this is one of the pictures of the event. Now, at last week's American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco, the 
team behind this actually presented a short video showing this in action. It's really more a sequence of frames showing the creator developing. And I would love to show it to you, except that they did have a big sign up saying, please don't take any photographs of it. So instead, I can actually link you to the session, which was uploaded to the AGU YouTube channel. And if you're interested in asteroid science at all, that's actually a pretty good session to watch because they have representatives from all the major missions. They also have like the people that built the mascot lander, which landed on Ryugu and got some pictures from the surface. They have uh, people developing the DART spacecraft and HERA, that's a mission which will slam into an asteroid and modify its orbit. So it's a super exciting time for people that are interested in space rocks. And I am one of those people. So, hope you all enjoyed this. I hope that Osiris Rex successfully samples its target. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.